Uh, today, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4 as we deal with the next name of God in our list of names. Stand with me, please, as we read just uh, five verses. Exodus chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Shall we pray together? Lord, very uh, interesting verses, and we certainly want to hear from you what these verses mean and how we might be able to make sense of them for our time and for our day. Please speak to us now through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated. So we've been studying the names of God. We've studied four of them already to list them. First, we began with the name I Am. Then we went to the name Yahweh, and then Elohim and El Shaddai. Today, we come to a fifth name, the name Adonai. Adonai is the name. In, in an earlier study, I mentioned that Adonai was a title, but it is also extensively used as a specific name of God. In reality, it's more a substitute for the name of God, so I suppose we can call it a bit of a nickname. Well, Adonai is translated Lord in our English Bible. That's with a capital L, lowercase o-r-d. Remember, Yahweh is all capital Lord. Uh, so in our English Bible, the word Lord with a capital L typically and always is and only is used in place of this name, Yahweh, mostly out of respect for his divine name, and is never used in regards to men or in relation to men. Remember, the ancient rabbis, of course, considered Yahweh much too holy for human lips, and so lest it should be pronounced by mistake, they got rid of the letters and gave us the Y-H-W-H and, and also replaced it many times with this name Adonai. Now Adonai is uh, actually a plural word. It's, uh, it comes to us in the plural form, in the plural uh, form of the singular word Adon. Adon, it doesn't have the A-I at the end. Now, uh, the Greeks borrowed this Hebrew word when they invented their mythological deity, Adonis. Adonis, they remember Adonis. Uh, I found out this week, by the way, I am related to him. Maybe you could see the resemblance. Anyway, the Bible uses uh, the word Adon uh, many times in its, in its singular form. But it also uses the plural word Adonai very often, and Adonai is used for God. Adon can often be applied to men, can also be applied to God, but Adon is not exclusively applied to God as is Adonai. Now this is of course significant in our study of the names of God, especially as we already considered the name Elohim. This name Adonai gives further evidence and support to the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, Adonai means master or owner, and it implies a relationship that is between the master and a slave. It involves the rights of lordship that Adonai has and the possession that he has over his servant. Uh, Adonai, the name, teaches us that God is our master owner, and if God is our master, then he has certain rights and permissions that govern our lives in order to govern our lives. And if and when we might use this word Adonai, or when we call the Lord, Lord, uh, we're speaking to God in relation to the fellowship or the connection or relationship that we have 
to God. In other words, we are admitting to him his right of ownership over our lives. In this master-slave relationship, two things are automatically assumed. First is possession, and the second is submission in this master-slave relationship. The difference is that we know that God is a good master, and he is the one who owns us, and so we gladly, happily submit to him. Now, the first mention of this name is found in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, in the first verse, I'll read to you. I, uh, in verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And in verse 2, Abram said, Lord God, or Adonai, Adonai Yahweh, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me, seeing that I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer. Eliezer is his slave. Now in this particular scenario, Yahweh is making a promise to Abram. It is a promise of protection and, and a promise of provision or reward, he called it. Abram, of course, responded with this confession of his submission to the Lord. Adonai. Adonai Yahweh. In other words, master at your service, you know, as you would hear that in the movies, you know, at your service, or perhaps uh, in some way in service you would hear someone say that, well, how can I serve you, or something like that. And that's what Moses, or Abram was saying, Master, I'm at your service. Now, the ancient world would have perfectly understood this master-slave relationship much better than what we ever could. In our modern thinking, of course, we can't imagine being a slave to anyone. Our history, of course, only reveals an abusive relationship between master and slave. And so we don't appreciate slavery at all. Slavery, of course, is not something that we would ever view as positive or beneficial. But the ancient world had a very different take on slavery or a very different understanding of it. In fact, in the story from Genesis chapter 15, as I mentioned, Eliezer was not family to Abram, but a slave, a servant. And Abram was willing to leave his entire inheritance to him, as we read there in verse 2. I go childless, Abram said, and the heir of my house is Eliezer. I'm willing to give everything to him. Now, the ancient world, in the ancient world, if a slave had a good master, as Abram was, well, there was a certain expectation of protection and provision. In the Old Testament law, there was even provision that was made for a slave to be released after a certain amount of, of faithful service. But that slave had the option, if he wanted to, to remain with his master. In, verse, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, in verse 16, we read this law regarding the slave. And if it happens that your slave says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl, a sharp instrument, thrust it through his ear to the doorpost of your house, and he shall be your servant forever. So a willing servant, a willing slave. This, in the New Testament, is known as the law of the bond slave. In other words, the Apostle Paul referred to himself as the bond slave of Jesus Christ, or the Greek word, the doulos of Jesus. That's what we all want to be. We have all call ourselves the servant of the Lord, the douloi, plural, the doulos of the Lord. And if Jesus is definitely your Adonai, which in the Greek, the Greek equivalent is kurios, if that is who you are, if that is what you claim to be, and if you claim that Jesus is your Lord, there is an expectation of his protection and his provision over your life, and that is his part of the agreement. But there's also the equal expectation of our willingness and our willing or loving submission and service that comes from us. That's our part. That is uh, the reason I've selected this particular story from Exodus for this morning. As Moses displays what might be considered a very inconsistent stubbornness, at least for a slave anyway, a slave who claims that uh, God is his Adonai, 
his master, his owner, and he himself being in a submissive relationship to Adonai, yet there was a stubbornness there. And with that stubbornness, we see that the Lord is not pleased at all. God chose Moses to deliver his people from their bondage to the Egyptians. And in chapter 4, God starts to coach Moses on how he was going to go to both the people and to Pharaoh and to do these miracles, these signs with, the, with his staff, turning it into a snake. This is what you're going to do, Moses, and I want you to go and talk. Well, in the middle of this training, Moses said, O oh Adonai, my Adonai, my master, listen, God, uh, I'm not eloquent. I'm not eloquent now or even since you have uh, come to me and I've become your servant. But I'm slow of speech and, and slow of tongue, he says. Moses here apparently feeling insecure with this plan of God's. I don't like this plan. And he starts to give God a lot of excuses as to why he may not be the man for the job. God, I stutter. I don't speak no good. And if I don't speak no good... I don't want to go out there and make a fool of myself. They're going to laugh at me. And so Yahweh needing to comfort his petrified prophet. In verse 11, the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes or, or heals the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? So Moses simply stating the truth. I don't speak very well. I, 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 I stutter. It's, it's not possible for me to do this job the way it needs to be done but God doesn't argue with the facts of the case here he only argues with Moses's confidence in this in this case in other words God needed to remind Moses to trust in God's ability to cure not in Moses's ability to communicate I'll take care of all that Paul Quoting God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, Paul said, most gladly, I will rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Or when I am weak, I trust God the most. When I think I'm strong, I'm too proud, I'm too cocky. I don't think I need God. That's when I get myself in trouble. <coughs> and that's pretty much what God is saying here to Moses. And so in verse 12 of our text, God said, Now therefore go, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But Moses has to continue this argument. It's like he's bent on getting God upset. And in verse 13 he says, Oh, my Lord, or oh, Master Adonai, Please send someone else. Send by the hand of whomever else you may send. He's, he's bowing out. He's asking God to, to send another person. Moses was saying, Lord, I don't want to. Huh? That's, that's a contradiction. You don't say, Master, my owner, no. You just don't, you don't get to do that in this ancient ancient relationship between master and slave just ask peter about that in acts chapter 10 you remember while peter was on the rooftop praying and he received a vision of a basket that was made out of a linen sheet and the the, the sheet or the basket was filled with all kinds of critters uh, creepy crawly things things that were forbidden by old testament law for good jewish people to eat and this sheet descended down from heaven. And then he heard a voice, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Eat it all. And Peter responded, Not so, Lord. Uh, Lord, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice said, What God has made clean, do not call common. You, you see, there was, again, that inconsistency in Peter's comments. He said, No, not so, Lord. He did exactly what Moses did. No, Lord, I won't do that. And Peter and Moses both must, must have thought they were meatloaf. I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> I would do... No, never mind. Don't make me sing. 
And this, of course, happened in the story of Peter three times. And three times the Lord rebuked Peter. Don't tell me what you can and can do. I make the rules around here. I'm the Lord. You called me so. I'm Adonai. I'm the master. So back to our story in Exodus 4. Moses said, Master, I love you. I would do anything for love, but I'd rather not do that if you don't mind. And the Lord basically said, well, I do mind, Moses, because you're not in charge here. I am. I do mind. And so verse 14, that's why you read this, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Who do you think you are, you little, you know? The Lord was angry. And the word anger here means nostril. It's like the Lord went, what? That's what it means. It means to snort in anger, to take a deep breath, like, what? God flared his nostrils and sighed. Obviously, God losing patience for his servant. This is inconsistency, and this inconsistency is really at the heart of of what I want to talk about today and what I want to bring out in this name, Adonai. <coughs> Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Why do you think you have the right to claim I'm your Adonai, your master, your owner, but you have no intention of obeying the things I tell you to do? Do you see the inconsistency that is there? Jesus is frustrated with that sort of behavior. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 10, Paul said, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What that means is don't annoy God, don't frustrate Him by resisting His will. And that's precisely what Moses was doing in our story. He was resisting the will of the Lord and behaving badly for someone who claimed that God was his Adonai. And that stubborn excuse-making resistance grieved God, frustrated God. And so God, who do you think you are? And it frustrated Jesus. And it frustrates him even still when we do it. In Philippians 2, I'd like you to turn there, if you wouldn't mind, to Philippians chapter 2, a passage that we recently covered. You know this passage. The Apostle Paul in verse 9 of Philippians 2 said, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, So now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Now, I'd like to take this passage and point out four things from this passage that relate to our relationship to Adonai. And the first thing is Jesus is Lord, there in verse 11. In verses 10 and 11, actually, uh, the, the passage tells us that there's going to come a day when everyone will confess that Jesus is Lord. He is Adonai. Now, he already is Adonai. He is Adonai over his church. He is Adonai over everything. He is Adonai, the master, the owner of the church, and the owner of anyone who belongs in the church. Paul said this a couple of times in a couple of ways. Have, do you not know that you are not your own? You were bought at a price. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There are different ways that he said it, but the, the meaning is the same. We belong to him. He purchased us. He redeemed us with his blood. But in this passage, this passage in Philippians 2, it suggests that he is Lord over all things, even people who don't believe in him, even people who don't belong in the church. He is Lord over them as well. It's just they may not know it. It's just a matter of time. They will know it. It's a matter of time that all mankind must admit to the truth of it. And unbelief will never change that. Unbelief cannot change it. We can doubt it, we can resist it, or we can reject it, but we cannot and will not ever change it. One day, every knee will bow, 
and confess that Jesus is Lord. And the confession of doubting Thomas, you remember that, is exactly what will be replayed before God's throne over and over again. Thomas, of course, doubted and refused to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, remember. Unless I see it with my own eyes, I want to put my fingers in his holes. But when he saw the risen Jesus standing before him, he simply confessed, My Lord and my God, Adonai Elohim. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. So if I'm to be saved, if we are to be saved, we must admit and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That means I surrender my life and my freedom to him. I surrender. He is my master. He is my owner, and I am his slave, and I belong to him. My life is no longer my, lo- my own. I, I do as he commands me to do because he is Adonai. And that brings me to the second point from the Philippians passage. Paul said, you have always obeyed in verse 12. And that brings us to the point of obedience. Obedience, dutiful or submissive compliance. I yield to you. It is the act, the practice of yielding or, or obeying. Submission and obedience to Christ are at the center of a relationship with Adonai. As Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Adonai, Adonai, and don't do what I say? On the flip side, Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Obey my commandments, John 14, 15. So, to Jesus, obedience is is simply and practically common sense. It just makes sense. If I'm your Lord, if you call me your Lord, and it's just common sense, you're going to do as I say. You're going to obey me. It just makes sense. And if Jesus is your Lord, that's the way we should think. Fortunately, those of us who do call him Lord, who do recognize him as master and owner, uh, we have come to discover that our master's yoke is easy and his burden is light because he is a good master. Extremely good. In fact, the psalmist writes this in Psalm 84, verse 10, Better is one day serving in your courts than a thousand somewhere else. I would rather be a doorkeeper, a servant, in the house of my God than to dwell in the posh tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he hold from those who walk uprightly. O Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of heaven's armies, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. So being a servant to Jesus is not only the best life, not only a good life, it's really the only life. It's the only life worth living. I like what uh, the old hymn writer John uh, Samus and and, and the music writer Daniel Towner uh, wrote in 1887 to that beautiful and beloved old hymn, Trust and Obey. Do you remember that one, some of you? Sums up this, this idea perfectly. The first verse in the chorus, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Beautiful old hymn, because Adonai is a good master and we serve him. We serve him. The third point I want to bring out from Philippians chapter 2 is that we are to work for his good pleasure. Verse 13, that we work for his good pleasure. God working in us to bring a, a pleasure to him. And as I said, we don't like slavery. It goes against everything we know and understand to be decent in our civilized way of thinking. And we'd have to be crazy to think that, that human slavery is or ever was a good thing. So we really need to approach the subject of slavery, even Christian slavery in this sense, slavery to the Lord, in a very theological or very spiritual mind, with a very spiritual mind. Theologically speaking, spiritually speaking, we are already slaves, theologically. We're slaves to sin, slaves to Satan, at least Christians were 
non-Christians are slaves to those things. And like it or not, we are subject to these laws of a, of a spiritual world, a spiritual realm, and, and there are forces that inhabit the unseen world. And we are subject to them, subjected to them. They affect us, in other words. Paul giving a wonderful explanation of spiritual slavery in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 said, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, he said, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching, this doctrine we have given to you, and you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You see, there is slavery. We are a slave to something. And to quote Bob Dylan, you're going to hurt somebody. <laughs> it may be the devil, oh, it may be the Lord. You're going to have to serve somebody. <laughs> Dylan fans, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. That was, those were his Christian days. Anybody have the album? I do. Oh, no, no. I, I thought I was the only one on the face of the earth that still had that. That's great. That's, that shocked me. What Paul is saying here, obviously, is that we're free from sin. And because we're free from sin, we're, we're now free to obey God. No, we choose to become the doulos of the Lord. Now I choose to serve him. That's my new life of faith. I get to serve the Lord. And if we're serving God, then, then we have the pleasure of bringing him pleasure. We have the privilege of bringing glory and honor to his name, as that is what we were created to do. And that becomes then an incentive, incentive for wanting to be his slave. Romans 6, Paul went on to say in verse 19, because of the weakness of your human nature, he's talking about the old nature, the old man, the flesh, because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. You see that beautiful little transition he makes there. This is why I'm talking about slavery. I know it's terrible you know, to even talk about it, but this is why I'm talking about it. He said, previously, you let yourself be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of those things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves to God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. How many can say amen to that? That's my life. That describes the conversion life. I, I used to live like a horrible slob, a pig, a, a sinner, a dog. But Jesus changed all that, and I'm now a new person, and I'm able to be a different man, a different person, and you can be too. That's the promise of what Jesus has done in your life. And it's not enough to say, well, that's my uh, Irish temper, that's my, uh, my nature, that's who I am. No, that's who you were. You can become new changed forever by the power of God. And we no longer need to make excuses, which takes me to the fourth point, a final point that I want to make from Philippians chapter 2, that he says, do all things, in verse 14, without complaining or disputing, if I may, without arguing or excuses. We have so many excuses, so many arguments why we can't be different, why we can't change, why we can't serve the Lord as we should. And lame excuses are certainly not a new invention. Moses had them. We saw in Exodus 3. In Luke chapter 9, we learn that there were excuses, and Jesus pointed them out. In verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, well, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If I may, I'll stop there for a second just to say, 
Jesus didn't use his own poverty as an excuse for not doing what was right. Jesus didn't use his own personal circumstance as an excuse for not doing the work of God. It was his delight to do it. He didn't use anything as an excuse. Then he goes on to talk about excuses in verse 58. Jesus, I'm sorry, verse 59. He turned to another person and said, follow me. But he said, Lord, Adonai, let me first go and bury my father. That's an excuse. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Get on with the business at hand. Yeah, but what about my father's funeral? Don't worry about that. He's not talking about the funeral. The man was no doubt saying, you know, my, my father's only got a few years left to live. Let me hang out with him a little bit, is what he's saying. He used that as a, as a reason not to get on with the business at hand. Verse 61, yet a, a, he turned to another one and said, or another one came to him and said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Notice the excuses there. I want to follow you, Lord, but I need to do this first. Master, I'll be happy to obey you. I'll do whatever you want, but I need to wait for the planets to align properly. And then I promise I'm I'm, I'm right there with you, but i got to wait for the planets. Why do you keep calling me Adonai if you have no intention of doing exactly as I've asked you to do? You're my servant. I own you. But you've forgotten that. You think you're the master, and I'm to serve at your bidding. That's not how the Christian life works. Never did. Perhaps we we should be more honest with him. Maybe we should tell him that we're so happy and thankful that you saved us, but now leave us alone. Go somewhere else. Go bother someone. Aren't there some others you can save? Let me live my life as I wish. And you know, it's unfortunate, but many Christians are happy to let Jesus save them, but they won't surrender to him. They won't surrender at all to his lordship. They'll let him be their savior, but they won't let him be their Adonai, their lord, their master, their owner. Incentive, you know, is a very powerful thing. Incentive gives us a motive and a reason for doing something. And our reasons for serving God are many. One, of course, as I've already mentioned, is because he owns us. He has a right to us. He bought us at a price. It was the blood of Jesus. He, he paid for us and has every right to us. That's a good reason to serve him. Another good reason is because by serving him, we bring pleasure to him or, or spiritual fruit of holiness to his name, glory to his name. But I don't think there's any greater incentive than the motive of love. Love. I serve Adonai with all of my heart, with all of my mind, soul, with all of my will, because I love him. And love is a powerful motivator. In Luke 11, there was a woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And her actions, of course, naturally blessed Jesus. But mostly, what blessed him the most was her attitude of gratitude, if you will. The master said in verse 47 of Luke 11, Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Now, her genuine love, mixed with this incredible sense of gratitude, drove her to the feet of Jesus, drove her to to place herself at his service. Master, I'm yours. And since she was forgiven of her sinful life, forgiven so much, he says, she loved me much and gratefully surrendered herself to Jesus. Love for the master, the good master, compels us and is a good motivator. Do you suffer from a case of the yabbats? You know, the yabbats? You know what that is? I want to do it, but... Yeah, but I, so I, I tell you, it's the most frustrating thing. I'll, I'll talk with someone, they come in, they want, they want my advice. They want my counsel. And I'll say, well, this is what I think the, the Lord would, would say. Here's his word. Yeah, but it's a case of the abbots. And it's not a good case. It keeps you 
from doing what the Lord has asked you to do. It is the excuses that constantly takes you off the track of serving Jesus Christ. If you're a Yabba person, repent. Acknowledge it. Recognize it. Stop blaming someone else for it. Listen, admit to what Jesus has already told us. We're sinners. That's why he died. And to say, John said in first chapter of his, his first epistle, if you say that you have no sin, then you make God a liar. What did he die for? He died for your sin. And if you don't think that you're a sinner worthy of that, or that you can claim that, then you've got the wrong message. Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. But first... I have something to take care of. What, what might it be? What is so important that would keep you from serving Jesus? Is it your girlfriend? My girlfriend's not a Christian, so I can't serve you. Really? Sounds like you need a new girlfriend. Sounds like you need to save your friend. My boss makes me work on Sundays. Why would that prevent you from serving Jesus at your job on Sundays? Nothing should prevent you from serving Jesus. Lord, I'd love to serve you if you let me win the lottery. Yeah, that, that would be nice too, but I don't know if you know this, you're gonna, your odds of getting struck by lightning are greater. That's what they say anyway. Let me get married first. Let me climb the ladder of success first. Let me have kids first. Let me get my kids through high school first. Make that college. All the excuses we have, they're all good excuses. They're just not good enough. They don't work. Because love for Jesus always finds a way to be faithful and fruitful, regardless of your situation or your position in life. But it, you've got to be willing to see or acknowledge Jesus as Adonai, your master, your owner. Above all things, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks for excuses to turn back is fit for the kingdom of God. No excuses. Adonai. Adonai must come above all things, including your own personal wants and desires, because he is your master. Before the great prophet Elijah confronted the heathen prophets of Baal to that famous face-off in 1 Kings, he challenged the weak-in-faith people with these words. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If Yahweh is Elohim, then follow him. If Baal is, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Now, these words are just as challenging to us today. If Jesus is Lord, then we should serve him. Don't you think? If he is Lord, what are we waiting for? If Jesus really is who, we, who he claims he is and who we believe he is, then we should serve him. Notice the people were completely silent in the story of Elijah, meaning they didn't make a commitment, they were, or at least they were hesitant to make this commitment. It wasn't until they actually saw the fire of God come down from heaven to consume the offering and the altar that the offering was on that suddenly they, suddenly they decided to, to call him Adonai. 1 Kings 18 and verse 39, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. <laughs> it's a funny story. It really is. If you can envision it. They were hesitant. I don't know, I don't know, if is, is he God? We don't know, we don't know. It wasn't until something was consumed, until fire from heaven scared them. You see, God has a way of sending trials that come like fire. And they're not designed in, in, in any way to harm you, because it didn't harm the people. But just to get you to see, I'm the Lord of this. I'm the master, and I own you. And I have a life that's better for you than the one that you think you have for yourself. And so long as you continue to play with it, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire. Joshua, in his closing comments of his book, chapter 24, said, Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served. Get rid of the excuses. 
and serve the Lord. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, choose today whom you will serve. Make your decision once and for all. But as for me and my house, my family, he said, we will serve the Lord. Now, Jesus is Adonai, at least to me, and I've decided to follow him and to serve him with my whole life. I don't care where I am. I don't care what I do with my life. Jesus will always be a part of it. I'll not turn back. What about you? Let's pray. Lord, we want so much to see you. As we sang this morning and prayed this morning, we want to see your power, we want to see your glory. We want to acknowledge you as Adonai, the master and owner over our lives. And with that, we have the expectation of protection and provision, while you have the expectation of our submission to you. And we want to do that today. There are, at least I know, a group of us in this room who would say anything, Lord. We will do anything because we love you. Your wish is our command. At your service, what would you have us to do? Lord, that is our desire, that is our prayer. There are some today who would like to acknowledge you as Lord for the first time. For the first time. Yes, they've been saved, they've been Christian, but they never thought about having you run their life. They never thought about actually surrendering to you and letting you change them to make them a new person. Well, Lord, today is that day. And if you're one of those people, say that to the Lord. Yes, Lord, it's me. I want to be a different person. I want to be a different woman, a different man. Change me, Lord. There's some here today who need to be saved. Jesus is not your Lord because you don't even belong to him because you never gave your heart over to him. He wants to save you this morning. He wants your sins to be washed away. He doesn't want you to have to endure the slavery of sin. I'm a slave to no man. Yes, you are. You are a slave. You're a slave to someone. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're serving someone. And today you have an option. You have a choice to ask Jesus to deliver you from sin and turn your life over to him. And it's a prayer, a simple prayer of faith, or a belief. I believe in you, Lord. And you can tell him that. You can confess that right now. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Confess it right now in your heart. I believe you, Lord. I believe I'm a sinner, and I believe you're the Savior who saves me from my sins. And so today I surrender my life to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and forgiving my sins. Today, my name is in the book of life, and I want it to remain there forever. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.